Epilogue I went back to Sacramento, but only to drop out of college. I couldn't just start back on the old track when so much had changed. Instead, I joined a band and spent the next few years playing bars on the West Coast, north into Oregon, and as far south as Baja. It was an abysmally unhealthy life, and I ingested a lot of substances, staying under the influence of something most of the time. As a result, I blotted out everything that had happened that summer, not only the bad parts, but the good, too. Not only Nathan's death, but also what I had learned about it from Egan not to mention whatever insights I might have gleaned if I'd pondered it the way I was supposed to. When I would wake at night, my heart thudding, my hands feeling Nathan slipping through them, one of his songs running through my head, those times God seemed too huge, too near, too dynamic and arbitrary to contemplate. For years, I shut it all down. In the 80s, I got into doing studio work in L.A. and calmed down a little. Then one day, I ran into Paige. I saw her on the street, and we spent the rest of the afternoon catching up. She worked in a movie studio, editing film. Movies, I said. You never told me anything about wanting to go into movies. Paige smiled. She was the L.A. lady with style now, carefully made up hands bejeweled, and nicely manicured. Honey, she said, there's a lot of things I never told you, because why would I? We only knew each other that one summer. She hadn't kept up with Nathan's family. They'd moved to a church in another town, and then she and her own family had moved to Nashville. I haven't been back to see my own folks in two years. I never wrote the Whitleys either, I admitted. I promised I'd keep in touch, but I didn't. By then I had lost track of my own mother, although I tried unsuccessfully to find her later. So Paige was the only person I knew with whom I had anything remotely resembling roots. We kept seeing each other. I think she took pity on me, knowing I saw her as family. And that's how it stayed, too. Except for hello and goodbye hugs, we never touched. Maybe, like me, she remembered that one terrible night we'd gotten physical and never wanted to repeat the experience. I only know that in my mind she was always Nathan's. She may have felt that way, too, because although she was always dating some guy or other, she never stayed with one for very long, and somehow she seemed to be looking past him the whole time. Meanwhile, L.A. grew sharper and shinier, coke wherever you looked, and I began to coast downward again, as if I were on a slide in the world's greatest amusement park, starting out at the top with all the lights glittering beneath me, but heading down all the same. By now I had contacts in Nashville, a gentler town, I thought, so I suspended the downward slide and relocated in the spring of 1988. Paige came to the airport to see me off, just as she and Artis had done when I left Tennessee sixteen years earlier. We had time for a drink, and she came as close as she ever had to talking about Nathan. She started out with a question that seemed almost pointless. So are you okay about going back? I'm going, aren't I? You know what I mean, she said, between sips of her margarita. Living there. You haven't stayed in Tennessee for any length of time since that summer. There'll be memories. I'll deal. You'll drive south some weekend, like I've done, back down to Berry Springs. And it's changed. I'll tell you that right now. I didn't know what had gotten into her. She was speaking almost compulsively. I'm sure it has. She slanted her eyes sideways at me as she sipped her drink again. River House burned down. Really, I said. When was that? A couple years ago, Dad said. I knew she'd finally gone back to her folks for a long overdue visit last year. So when were you going to tell me that? Would it have changed your life to know it any earlier? I guess not. Not unless I had learned that the river man had burned with it. Right after we first met in L.A., Paige told me Egan had left town even before the Whitleys and that River House had held a few other languishing taverns before standing empty. We didn't mention it again, along with all the other things we never talked about. Would you be able to find Nathan's grave, you think? I, um, hadn't really thought about it. Bullshit. 
she told me, and of course it was. Of course I had thought about how near I'd be to Berry Springs, and the Whitley's old parsonage, and the cemetery where Nathan was buried. I went last year when I was there. Her voice was matter-of-fact, as if she were talking about getting her hair done. I remembered right where it was. Nathan John Whitley. Even put flowers on it. "'Good for you,' I said, trying to match her tone. Then I saw the two tears spilling down, one on each cheek, although she kept her mouth firmed around the straw of her margarita. But it still didn't fix it. She looked up at me, her green eyes drowning. I wanted to fix it, and I can't. Paige, you're not going to fix it. It happened, and there's this hole in my heart, and it won't close up. I knew that Paige, like everybody else in L.A., had had her share of therapy, and I wondered what the hell she'd talked about, if not this. Closure, I told her. You never had any closure. And you get to go back and live there! She swigged determinedly at her drink, although more tears were coming. And that isn't fair. You'll be where Nathan was, and I'll be here all alone. Come see me, any time. Her straw rattled in the bottom of her empty glass. Maybe I will, she said, and got out her compact to powder her nose. But when she hugged me goodbye, just before I got on the plane, I felt her tears again, soaking my shirt, the same way I had felt her and Artis's tears sixteen years ago when I left Tennessee. Nashville's soft, early summer air struck at my face in a completely different way from the drier L.A. heat. Paige was right. It did bring back memories, along with the considerate way people listened when I spoke, and with the familiar drawl I noticed everywhere those first few weeks that I settled in. On Memorial Day, I gave up and drove south to Berry Springs. What I'd said to Paige about closure had nagged at my mind in a physician-heal-thyself sort of way. I decided to go case the damn town, look at the damn grave, and have it over with. Most of all, I wanted to see River House in ashes. The Methodist church and parsonage looked about the same, except that the church parking lot had been paved. I parked for a minute, not behind the house where I used to park the station wagon, but near the church. Still, I could look down through the field, which had been mowed, to the trees along the river, and then turn my head to see the back door of the parsonage and the familiar concrete step. I suppose I could have found the present minister, explained who I was, and asked to go inside the church. But after a few minutes of looking, feeling my throat ache with the pressure of memories I still couldn't face, I pulled away and drove on south of town. River House was anticlimactic. I'd hoped for a blackened ruin, but apparently that had been cleared away. A trailer sat on the site, with a pickup truck beside it. I hardly slowed down as I passed. So much for that, I thought. The cemetery lay a little farther south. Other people were there because it was Memorial Day, and I felt uneasy and impolite. I should have brought flowers, not that Nathan would have cared. Remembering vaguely the direction of his grave, I made my way toward it. I wondered if I'd feel anything when I got there. I had never felt Nathan's presence, not the way I'd heard other people say they'd sensed the presence of someone who had died. Maybe at this quiet grave I would. Suddenly, fiercely, I hoped I would. Already I missed him worse than I'd ever let myself before. I found his grave easily, with the simple stone recording only his name and the dates of his birth and death. But I had no time to get sentimental or wait for a presence or anything else before my eyes wandered to a larger stone next to Nathan's, one of those double markers for a husband and wife. And with a wrench at my heart, I saw that it also bore the name Whitley across the top in capital letters. Under the smaller name Elaine Ruth, the dates were still blank. But Robert John had died eight months ago and had been buried beside his son. For a minute I stood trying to assimilate this fact. Then, carefully, I sat down in the grass beside Nathan's grave and began to trace the carved N of his name with my fingers up and down, letting the sun warm my back, 
letting the double loss wash over me, letting my mind go blank and float in the still summery haze. I wasn't sure how long I'd sat there, but presently I became aware of someone looking at me. I glanced around and saw a woman and a boy standing uncertainly about ten feet away. The woman carried an armload of flowers, and one long braid fell forward over her shoulder. In spite of her frown, I recognized her right away. "'Hey, artist,' I said. Her face cleared, and as I got up, she set down her flowers and came straight into my arms. Only then did she say, Tim, into my shoulder. When she pulled away to look up at me, she was beaming. You're the same as ever, I told her truthfully. Her sturdy figure even felt the same in my arms. So are you, she said, but I knew my face had aged more than it should have by now. I can't believe this. What are you doing here? I explained about moving to Nashville, and she told me she worked there at an architectural firm. She'd been married and divorced. And you will have deja vu, she said, when you look at Joel here. I looked at the kid behind her. He was only about nine years old, and his hair was sandy, and his eyes were a hazelish brown. But still, it was Nathan's face that stared solemnly back at me. Hey, Joel, I said. Joel Nathan, Artis told me proudly. Your Uncle Nathan's friend? Joel asked. Yep. You're the guy that was with him when he got drowned? I nodded. Joel studied me dubiously. Artis had evidently raised him on the legend of her brother, and I wondered if I was measuring up to how he'd imagined the Tim character. The thought made me smile as I looked at him, and quick as a flash he grinned back with what would be his Uncle Nathan's smile as soon as all the teeth grew in. I was never sure when Artis and I fell in love, but we did, and even though it was different from how I'd felt about Paige, I knew it was right. We got married a year later, with Joel's wholehearted approval, and we bought a house south of Nashville, and life grew smoother and happier than I'd ever known it to be. Artis and I grieved for her father together. He'd had a heart attack, he was only sixty-two, and died the next day. She told me that the last thing he said, just before he died, was, Nathan? In a sort of surprised voice. After that, Mrs. Whitley had an apartment in Nashville for a while, and then stayed with us until her Alzheimer's necessitated a retirement home. When Artis would visit, her mother would talk about Nathan as if he were still alive. Then Artis would come home, all shook up, and talk to me about him. So Nate became a presence in my life again, as Artis and I settled in together and Joel grew up. Which makes it harder to explain why we still didn't pay any attention to the master tape of Nathan's music. But to my surprise, Artis told me early on that Joel didn't even know the tape existed. For years she herself hadn't known where it was. Her father had put it away and never mentioned it. When she ran across it after his death, She'd been too depressed to bring herself to do anything about it. And she didn't tell Joel she'd found it because, she said, she didn't want him pestering her to let him hear it. So I respected her wishes, relieved that it wasn't for me to decide anyway, and figuring that some day we'd be grown up about it and have the tape mixed down. But somehow we kept putting that day off, and the master stayed on a shelf in my studio, indistinguishable from other tapes and boxes piled there, until it became a fixture, like the pink plastic lay Joel draped around the kitchen clock as part of the decorations for his twelve-year-old birthday party and forgot to take down again. We got so used to seeing that lay, we never thought to take it down, even when we gave a posh Christmas party years later. Not until Paige called did we do what we should have done all along. Stop pretending that Nathan's music had died when he had. After I'd listened to the CD, Artis said it was her turn. She slipped it into the boom box she keeps in the kitchen to listen while she started supper. I sat down at the table where I could see her face and be near if she needed me. She wiped tears steadily as she worked and listened, and I realized that the memories Nathan's music evoked in her head must be completely different from mine. She didn't know much about what had really happened the last summer of Nathan's life, and she hadn't been involved with the music. 
Her memories of Nate came from earlier years. I marveled at the network of associations that would let these same songs take her back to a whole childhood with him, a whole different place. Joel wandered in halfway through the CD. Comprehension dawned in his face as he realized what we were listening to, and he sat down at the table, too. Feeling myself suddenly in a new brave mood of facing things, I watched him as Nathan's voice sounded in our ears, trying to glean as much of Nate's presence from him as I could. At twenty, his hair is still lighter and his eyes darker than Nathan's. He's never attained Nathan's height, and his hands are smaller and squarer, differences that come from the father who walked out when he was still a baby. And although Joel is an absolute genius on computers, he didn't inherit Nathan's musical ability. Still, the face is like enough for me to catch my breath every once in a while, especially when Joel is in certain moods. That afternoon, as he heard Nathan's voice for the first time, I watched his face changing, shutting down, veiling, the way his uncles used to do. Suddenly he got up and walked out the back door, down through our sloping backyard, and onto a path that led into a wooded area behind our house. I could see him out the window, his hands in his pockets, shoulders hunched, like someone else I used to know. Artis watched him go, too, and then raised an eyebrow at me. You go talk to him, okay? He's still mad at me. I only told him about the CD this morning, remember, and he was furious because I didn't let him know before. So I went trudging down through the backyard and onto the path myself, leaving her alone with Nathan's music. You'll be all right? I'd asked her, and she'd kissed me for answer. Joel had a head start, so I knew I wouldn't find him until he stopped. But I also knew where he'd end up. After trailing through a patch of woods, the path straightened and went down to the edge of Swan Creek, and that was where Joel stood kicking at a clump of grass in the shallows and getting his shoes wet. When he heard me coming and glanced around, I saw the angry set of his mouth. Hey, I said, and he shrugged at me and went on kicking. What's the matter? I asked. He still didn't answer, and I said, What? before I realized he was trying to think how to tell me. You could even hear him breathe, man, he said finally. Yeah, I know. I mean, he still sounds so... Joel succeeded in kicking the clump of grass loose from the mud and sending it bobbing off on the gentle current. So alive! And he's not! And why isn't he? And all that! When my own father's such a jerk, and he's... He ended with something between a head shake and a shudder. I couldn't blame him. Artis had brought him up with such loving stories about Nathan, and because his own father had never given him the time of day, Joel had naturally romanticized his uncle. Hearing Nathan's voice for the first time had overwhelmed him. "'I don't know what to tell you,' I said. "'I know how you feel.' Joel twisted sharply to face me, and I saw tears in his eyes. "'I want to know what the fuck happened to him, and why everybody wants to keep it hidden.' Joel, you know what happened to him. He worked on his music and wouldn't come home and drowned while you tried to talk to him. I know all that. But there's got to be more to it than that. And you and Mom won't tell me. Your mom doesn't know all of it, I said. And you do? All the memories dredged up by the music, the half-realized truths I'd buried for years, bubbled in my brain and heart as I looked at him. I've never talked to your mom about this, I said at last. It's the same as with Nate's music. There'd be a lot of pain involved if she heard, if she knew. But you're grown now, and you're asking, so I'll tell you. And I did, as much of that summer as I could remember, and as much about the river man as I'd ever understood. We sat on the ground, the grasses blowing in our faces, and I tried to tell him how Egan had taken over Nate's brain and heart and had gone straight for his spirit as well. I told him about my part in it, my craziness for Paige, and how that had hurt Nathan, made him lose faith in the good stuff of the world until Egan was the only person he trusted. And I told Joel that I had always suspected Nathan had deliberately let go of me, because it was the only way he knew to get away from Egan. 
Last of all, I told how I'd gone to River House for Nathan's things, and how, in spite of himself, Egan had communicated to me that bright vision of Nathan on the other side. Joel considered for a while. You never told Mom any of that? If she asked me, I would, but she never has. I'm not sure she'd want to hear that some sort of demon came after her brother and that he might have drowned on purpose to get away, or that I used to be hot for Paige when she and Paige are friends. Joel nodded. So what happened to Egan? I thought of Egan saying there would always be somebody else. I had never doubted that he had eventually picked himself up and gone back out into the world. For a while, in fact, I'd been afraid he would come after me. I developed a phobia of mirrors, especially in public places, afraid I would see Egan behind me, grinning over my shoulder. But I never did, and over the years the fear dried up. Started over somewhere else, I guess, I said. Yeah, once he'd finished off Uncle Nathan. You're missing the point, I told him. Egan got him all right, took him over, but he wasn't allowed to keep him. Nathan died, Tim. He lost the game. He did not lose the game. He got to pass go early and collect $200. But what I'd been shown all those years ago was so slow in coming back that I could make no impression on Joel. He only gave me a jaded look at the goofy metaphor I'd used. Nathan was not defeated, I insisted. He was preserved. So why couldn't God have preserved him from this guy in the first place and let him live his whole life and make his music? It has something to do with choosing, I said slowly. Maybe Nathan made some choices that couldn't be reversed, at least not here. Then I remembered I hadn't told him about the apparition I'd seen in the car outside River House of Nathan turning into a bitter and mean spirit. That got a wide-eyed wow out of him. But some people do get to stay and be mean, he pointed out, like Hitler. But that's just it. Nathan didn't choose that. He didn't want to be mean. I've never seen anybody fight so hard to be good, to do right. All the way to the end. I was feeling my way, trying to put into words what I'd known was there in my brain, but had never taken out and examined. He just got lost. He took some wrong turns, and God said, I'm not going to let this happen to you, and came and got him. Joel shook his head. You said you thought he let go on purpose, he said. That's not being taken. That's suicide. I couldn't argue with that. I didn't believe killing yourself was a good idea, and I was pretty sure Nathan had been alive when he let go of me. But wasn't it possible that at the very end, hearing Egan screaming over the rush of the river, Nathan had sent up a desperate prayer asking if it was okay to let go, okay to come ahead now, and that he had been answered with a quiet affirmative? Was that suicide? But I could tell I'd lost Joel. He had Nathan's stubborn streak. He knew what he knew, and that was it. I don't know, Joel, I said mildly. I just remember it made sense then that he didn't have to go on being miserable for 60 years. He got to go somewhere else and be bright, like Egan said. Joel raised an eyebrow at me. And what if Egan was lying about that, making it up? He was the devil, wasn't he? According to you, anyway. Maybe he was just dicking with you one more time. Maybe. But what if he wasn't? What if the brightness he talked about is reality? And right now we're just in some weird dream, waiting to wake up. Just for a second I saw it flash in his eyes, the vision of it all turned around, before they went dark again. You don't even believe that anymore, he said. I can tell you don't. I haven't thought about it for so long, I said lamely, but he was already getting to his feet and tramping back down the path not caring if I followed or not. That night I lay awake, artists asleep beside me, and the house dark, yet inside my head everything was burning light. I couldn't tell if the light was heaven or hell fire, and I couldn't see Nathan anywhere in it. And I wondered if Egan had been faking me off, the way Joel said, 
if, after all, Nathan had been cast into an abyss, eternally falling, never safe, never real again, just gone. I was back to the days after his funeral, so shaken I couldn't even cry. I had to start all over. I lay in the burning darkness and prayed for the first time in years, the way people pray when they're against the wall, prayed for the sake of Joel, whom I love as if he were my own. I'd realized, talking that afternoon to my almost son, that I'd done what Nathan had done. Out of fear, I'd shut down some current of trust and belief, and now I wasn't able to make sense of things for Joel or for myself. So I prayed for a sign. I didn't ask for absolute proof. I only asked to have my faith restored, to know that Nathan was somewhere safe after all, and that he was still Nathan, and that he was joyful. And after that, I forgot about it for a while. I was playing a short but intense session, buried in the studio for a full week. At last it was over, and I was able to surface, with extra money we hadn't planned on. So I headed downtown for Groon's Guitars, just to skip away from the old Ryman Auditorium. I didn't have anything in mind to buy. I just wanted to look at the guitars, at the lovely shimmering wood and glinting metal of them, every sheen and shade you can think of. I wandered around, trying one here and there, in one of those vague, floating moods I usually get when a session's over, and that may have made me more receptive to what happened. Basically, it was this. I was checking out a Loudon, a mocha acoustic which chimed pure and vibrant like a harp. I sat playing softly, enjoying the sound, thinking about nothing in particular, and certainly not thinking about Nathan. Then I looked up and saw him. He sat near the front window with a top-line Gibson on his knee, Nathan, twenty years old, in jeans and a blue work shirt, fingering the guitar strings blissfully. I couldn't hear what he was playing, but the sunlight from the window shone full in his face, and I could see every detail, the strong tendons working in his hands and forearms, the glossy strands of his hair. He looked healthy, real, alive. I must have stood for several seconds without moving or breathing, not frightened, certainly, but too shocked to take a breath. Then he looked over at me and grinned, that delighted smile that squinched his eyes into slits. I didn't exactly hear his voice with my ears, but suddenly it rang in my head. Isn't this a cool place, Tim? As I watched, he stood up, hooked the Gibson onto its hanger, and shot me another smiling glance. Then, with the unhurried stride I remembered, he went around a corner into the rear wing of the store. The second he disappeared I was able to move, and I went after him, around the same corner, still clutching the Loudon. And of course he wasn't there, and there was no way anybody could have left from that part of the shop. I looked behind me, but he was gone. I went back and hung up the Loudon. I touched the Gibson he had played, but could feel no warmth lingering in the wood. Finally reaction set in. My legs started to shake, and I sat down, trying to figure out what it was I had seen. Then I remembered what I'd prayed for. More than a year has gone by since then. This morning I've carried my coffee out to the deck, where I can look down through our hillside neighborhood to the main street in the valley, straight through the thinning leaves to the red-spired church I can never see in the flush of summer. My eyes roam past it to where the hills start up again, daubed with the pinks and reds and golds that fade daily. In my hand, I have Nathan's CD, the soundtrack from the movie Winter Apples. The film itself, one more black comic saga about a dysfunctional family, didn't impress me. But Nathan's delicate songs lent it depth, and the album has become a hit on its own. In fact, a sort of cult is growing up around Nate and his music. Joel, especially, thinks that's pretty cool, one reason being that, as Nathan's nephew, he gets to reap the benefits in his social life. The CD cover is a watercolor in greens, deepest at the bottom, then washing paler and paler through layers of hills until the highest mountain edge hardly shows against the faint mint sky. 
Inside is the picture of Nathan that Paige and Artis and I agreed should be the one, the laughing one of him stretched in the grass, his hand flung up against his shoulder. I'm even fonder of this picture than before, because it is exactly how he looked when I saw him in the guitar shop. I have never told anyone that I saw Nathan that day in Groon's. Joel, at his skeptical age, would think I'd gone batty or was just trying to impress him. I'll tell Artis some day soon, and Paige will like to hear it as well. But so far, I have kept quiet about it, held it to me, letting it stay my own secret revelation for a while. I can't define what I saw, ghost, spirit, angel, but I know it came from outside me, and that it was meant as a direct bolstering of my own faith, not of Joel's or Artis's or anyone else's. Joel, I understand now, will have to find his own revelation. As for me, I am back full circle to the riverman's vision of Nathan's brightness. In my mind, Nathan is safe and joyful, mirthful even, his spirit strong and undamaged by what Egan tried to do to him. I can imagine his relief and delight at finding that the God he had so feared and mistrusted was none other than the breath of his music, after all. I can imagine him not really so far away, no farther away than if he lived on the other side of the world a few centuries ago, unreachable, but no more dead than I am. Wherever he is, he's still Nathan, going about his business, making his music, still thinking about me as often as I think about him, still a friend of mine. alone on a telephone wire outside Braving the rain while the thunder and lightning subside Wings touch the ground Grounded by birds Oh